In the near future, people can choose to grow their babies in pods. But one couple battles through the philosophy and morality of the procedure. In the bedroom, Rachel admires her pregnant belly in front of the mirror. Suddenly, she wakes up and realizes that it was just a dream. Then she starts her morning by eating the breakfast her smart home prepared and takes her daily gut intelligence test. Elena, the cognitive AI assistant, notes her decreasing serotonin levels in the past few days and suggests suggests adding a nature pod session to her schedule. However, the woman declines the suggestion because she's busy at work. Later, Rachel wakes her husband Alvi and tells him she's heading out. On the train, she sees a woman with an artificial womb pod strapped to her body. Meanwhile, the husband spends his morning in the apartment greenhouse potting plants. In the office, Rachel leads the presentation of the newest cognitive assistant AIs called Masha's. Minutes later, the HR director calls the woman into the office to inform her about her promotion. The HR director asks what her husband does for a living, and Rachel says he's a botanist. The older woman suggests that the couple seriously consider starting a family, especially since the womb center now belongs to the Pegasus company. She adds that the company will cover the down payment should Rachel and her husband wish to conceive. In Rachel's office, Masha schedules a nature pod session for her during lunchtime. Suddenly, she receives a call from the womb center to inform her that a spot opened up, and they'd like her to call them back to secure her spot and arrange a tour. When she calls back, they agree on a Thursday tour of the facility. Then, the woman enjoys her calm nature pod session, where she dreams of holding a baby by the beach. In his workplace greenhouse, Alvi's students are apprehensive about trying a fig from a tree since they're accustomed to eating food manufactured by machines. That afternoon, Rachel tells her colleague Alice that she and Alvi got a spot at the womb center. Delighted for her friend, Alice says they should celebrate the news with their respective husbands. But Rachel admits she's unsure how to proceed since she hasn't even told told Alvi they were on the waitlist. After work, Rachel speaks to her AI therapist, Eliza, who asks why she never told Alvi she was on the waitlist. The woman says it's because she is worried about her husband's reaction since he wants a natural child. However, the AI assures her that even if their baby grows inside an artificial pod, it won't be any less natural than one born inside a human uterus. Later at a breathing bar, Alice tells her friend that she needs to tell Alvi about the womb center before Thursday. In the apartment, the wife is about to open the conversation, but the husband recounts how his students were initially apprehensive about interacting with nature earlier but eventually opened up to the experience. He adds that the world unraveled when companies began treating nature like a commodity, leaving people emotionally starved. On Thursday, Rachel attends the tour by herself. The clients watch a video of the Pegasus founder talking about how he started the company to allow women to have flourishing careers that aren't hindered by laborious pregnancies, while addressing the declining birth rate in first world countries. Then, Womb Center director Linda Wozczak welcomes the clients before starting the tour. In the incubation room, Linda shows the clients a pod with a baby growing inside and shows them how they can use their phones or tablets to expose the child to different audio media. She also says they can choose the types of flavors their baby feeds on, suggesting various options so the child isn't a picky eater. A client asks how long the pod's autonomy is when disconnected from the base, and Linda says it can be separated for up to 48 hours, which allows the parents to take the pod when traveling. Rachel asks if the baby can hear the outside world in utero, and Linda says yes and encourages them to speak to their child even when it's inside the pod. Later, Linda asks Rachel for a deposit to confirm her interest in the procedure. That evening, Alvi tells his wife that he got a notification about an $8,700 deposit and asks if they should notify the bank. However, Rachel comes clean and says she was the one who transferred the money to the womb center after taking a tour. Confused, the husband says he doesn't know what she's talking about. So the wife admits she placed them on a wait list last year because she never expected them to call back. Upset, Alvi expresses his disappointment that she went on the tour and agreed to grow their child inside a pod without informing him. Remorsefully, the woman apologizes and says she only did it because she wants to have a baby with him. So he hugs her and says it's okay. To appease his worries, she suggests they talk to Alice and her husband Ben to learn more about the experience. The next evening, Ben shows the couple his pod carrier, while Alice talks about how having the option of growing a baby in a pod allows a couple to have equal childcare responsibility. When Ben asks when they'll take the tour, Rachel lies and says they don't know. 
Then he asks Alvi if he wants to hold the pot, but the man politely declines, still wary of the procedure. In the apartment, Alvi expresses his concern about the pod's plasticky material, but Rachel says all that matters is that the baby thinks it's a real womb. He says that if he could get pregnant, he'd carry the baby by himself, and his wife reminds him that Ben literally carried the baby in a carrier. However, the husband reiterates that he wishes he had more time to ponder the decision, but Rachel says they could lose their spot at the womb center if they asked for more time. Then she tells him to speak to Eliza because that's what she does whenever she feels stuck. During the therapy session, the man argues with the AI whom he believes doesn't have a soul and isn't qualified to understand human emotions and problems. After the session, Alvi lies and tells his wife that he had a great chat with Eliza. At a restaurant, the husband continues listing his concerns regarding the pod baby, so Rachel defeatedly says they don't have to do it since she doesn't want to keep arguing with him. That night after the couple makes love, he says he changed his mind and thinks they should do it. She asks why, and Alvi says it's because he can see how much it matters to her. The next day, the couple meets with Linda who asks if it's important to them that Alvi is the baby's father. When they're confused about why that's even a question, the woman explains that all they need to conceive the baby is Rachel's ovum and her skin cells, which means they won't need any DNA from a male donor. However, she adds that if they wish to have a son, they will need the Y chromosome from Alvi. Without hesitation, Rachel insists her husband be the child's father, and they agree that they'll let nature decide regarding gender. Eventually, the couple nervously watches the ovum's fertilization while Linda narrates everything happening on screen. After the successful insemination, Linda congratulates the expectant parents. Minutes later, a worker shows them the zygote inside a canister. In the apartment, the couple receives a call from Rachel's parents, and her father tells Alvi to think about selling his property on Shell Island since they could use the money now that they're expecting. Aware of how her husband feels about the topic, the wife tells her father to drop the subject. For the next few days, Rachel has access to the baby's progress on her gadgets and also uses them to feed the child. One night, Alvi tries to initiate lovemaking, but the wife politely asks him to give her a few weeks since she's preoccupied with the baby. The next day, Rachel asks her husband if he wants to join her in listening to the baby, but he says they won't hear anything since it's only been a few days since its inception. Later in the incubation room, she asks the nurse if she can see their baby because the window won't open, and the nurse explains that they keep the embryo in complete darkness for the first seven weeks or until the first heartbeat is detected. Suddenly, one of the pods beeps, and the nurse says it's ready for delivery. She adds that the device detects special proteins and hormones in the amniotic fluid, indicating the baby is ready. When Rachel asks what the stated due date is for, the nurse says it's just an estimation because nature still knows best. That night, Rachel dreams of having a C-section and birthing an egg. The next day, she tells Eliza about the strange dream she's been having lately, and the AI reminds her that dreams aren't reliable analytical material. Weeks later, the couple listens to the baby's heartbeat, and Linda informs them that they can take the pod home for two weeks at six months of gestation. Then they open the tiny viewing window and stare at the embryo. Months later, Alvi sees the baby's room that Rachel decorated and suggests placing a live plant. However, the wife thinks it's better if he designs a hologram version. Offended, the man walks out of the room, and his wife follows. She says it might be a good idea to sell the property on Shell Island like her father suggested since they never go there anyway. Alvi argues that it's because she never wants to visit, and she says they don't need to because the city has nature pods. Nevertheless, the husband insists he won't raise their child with pods as it's only experience with nature. At the public pool, Rachel curiously watches a pregnant woman. In the changing room, the woman takes Rachel's hand and places it on her belly so she can feel it kicking. That evening, Alvi sees their baby's pod in the living room, and his wife says she brought it home because it's their home period. She thinks spending time with it in their apartment might do them good. Unsure how to proceed, they carefully transfer the pod to the bedroom. While making love, Alvi says he can't continue knowing their child is in the room with them. He carries it toward the nursery, and he almost trips and nearly drops it. Seeing that it upsets his wife, he explains that she'll have to accept that their baby will stumble and fall at some point in its life. As they prepare for bed, they hear the pod emitting a noise, and they rush back to the nursery. Alvi accuses his wife of forgetting getting to feed the baby, so she reminds him that he has access to the same apps and shares equal responsibility for the child's well-being. The next day, they visit the Pegasus company's private school. A man mentions
mentions that his nephew, born in the womb center, doesn't have dreams. So Linda says it's a side effect they're working on, but assures all the parents that it's nothing to worry about because dreams serve no evolutionary purpose. The next day, while Alvy works in the apartment greenhouse, he is alerted when the pod runs low on food, so he replenishes the supply. Then, he allows the baby to listen to whale sounds before opening the window so he can see the child. In the office, Masha mentions Rachel's decreased work productivity in the past few days. In the apartment, Alvy secures the baby on his body using a pod carrier. For the next few weeks, the man spends most of his time taking the pod all over the city while reading books aloud so the baby can hear him. After class, Alvy's boss tells him that they've decided to slowly downsize the greenhouse because maintenance costs them too much money. The older man says they can replace the real plants with holograms, upsetting the botanist. That evening, the husband gets emotional while watching a documentary about penguins. Suddenly, Rachel opens up the possibility of bringing the pod back to the facility earlier than expected, but the husband says having it in the house has been great. The next day, while cleaning the pod, Rachel finds dirt in the nooks and crannies. At Alice's house, Rachel tells her friends that she worries her husband might be reckless with the pod, but the women assure her he's just excited to be a father. That night, she dreams that the pod is no longer beside her, so she frantically searches the room. But when she stands in front of the mirror, she sees her pregnant belly. Days later, Alvy says he received books from his mother about attachment therapy, which is a belief that spending time with a baby helps the child develop empathy. Rachel argues that the entire point of having a pod baby is for detachment, so the husband says acknowledging differing ideologies is healthy. Seconds later, the wife opens up about how she isn't doing well and asks that they speak to Elisa. During the therapy session, Rachel tells the AI they're having to difficulty adjusting because everything seems to revolve around the pod. She adds that her husband is successfully bonding with the child while she isn't. Alvy thinks she needs more alone time with the baby, but she argues that maybe she isn't ready to be a mother. So for the next few days, Rachel carries the pod around on a carrier but feels self-conscious about what people think when they see her in public. One day, she brings the pod to a work meeting. Later, Alice tells her that HR might not like her bringing the pod to work and that people might label her as a distracted mom. So the co-worker takes Rachel to a small room in the office where the others place their pods while at work. Hours later, the woman realizes she's late for a workshop at the womb center. After the workshop, the couple places their pod back in the incubation room, and Rachel says she wishes they could spend more time with it. For the next few days, the couple feels increasingly lonely due to the pod's absence. One night, Rachel dreams of holding a baby while walking on a beach. The following day, she heads to the apartment greenhouse. She takes a plant and places it in the nursery. Nursery, to Alvi's delight. In the office, the HR director speaks to the woman about her decreased productivity at work, and Rachel denies that she has depression. Soon the couple meets with Linda, who asks them their preferred date for the induced birth. They wonder why, so the woman explains that the pods are in high demand, so they need to induce at 39 weeks. When Rachel asks if they can keep the pod at home until it's ready for birth, Linda says the rule forbidding it is in the fine print of the signed contract. As they exit the building, Alvy tells his wife to wait for him outside. He returns to the nursery and steals their pod. After waking from a dream where she takes a baby home from a supermarket, Rachel enthusiastically tells Alvy they should go to Shell Island and have the baby there. When the husband asks why, she says she doesn't want their child's first moments to be in the womb center. So the man speaks to Linda and explains that his wife is in a bonding phase with a baby. The woman reminds him that the pod should have stayed in the facility. Alvy argues that the baby is under their jurisdiction, but Linda reminds him that the pod is the womb center's property. Then he admits that he and his wife are considering a home birth, and Linda says they'll need a self-generated birth code to open the vessel, and she advises against their plan. However, the couple pushes through with their decision to head to Shell Island. For the last days of gestation, they spend time with a pod in the peaceful cabin near the beach. One night, Rachel notices that the pod's base isn't turning on. Alvy realizes that the womb center remotely disconnected their access to the facility. So to calm his worried wife, the husband reminds her that they have 48 hours of autonomy and must trust that the baby is ready for birth before then. The next day, the pod alerts them that the baby is ready. Rachel tries to enter the baby's conception date as the birth code, but it doesn't work. 
Panicked, Alvi says he'll break the device open with tools. He removes the screw top, but the opening is still too small for the infant, so he pries the two halves open. Then Rachel wraps their child up in a towel, and the couple stares lovingly at their offspring. The next day, the woman packs the empty pod in a box. Then she bikes to town and drops it off at the post office. After the errand, she heads back to the cabin, and she happily lays down next to her child and husband. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.